Hi, welcome back. Now we're going to carry on with the second part of this video, which is on the physical science section from question 15 to question 28. If you are new to this video, please look at part 1 where I covered the life science questions from question 1 to question 14. Now, if you are my student, please make sure you have your paper with you and you have your green pen. If you are new to this channel, welcome and let's learn together. Let's turn to question 15. Now, Raymond used a cylinder with a curved up base as shown below in his experiment. He wanted to investigate the condensation of water vapour using this cylinder. Now, he poured 100 cubic centimeter of cold water into the cylinder and left it on a table as shown below. Now, I've already pre-coloured this. What does this mean? Now, I know that there's under the water cycle questions, the condensation is a process where the water vapour will lose heat and change state right? from gas to liquid. Now, and this happens on a cooler surface. That's where the losing of heat happens. So if there's cold water inside here, then of course the surface in contact with the cold water will be the cooler surface. So the red color portion will all be these cooler surfaces. And it is on these cooler surfaces that the water vapor will lose heat, change state from gas to liquid. And that is the idea of condensation here. Now, after a few minutes, Raymond observed some water droplets forming on the parts of the cylinder. So where would the water droplets form? Of course, on the sides here. But what about this curved bottom? Now, if it's curved up, it means that this bottom part, this white color part is actually air. And air is made up of different kinds of gases, including water vapor. That is why the water vapor that is in, in this curved up part of the bottle will also touch the cooler surface of the bottle, lose heat, change it, and condense into liquid. So that's why the answer for this is number three. Let's go to the next question. Now, during a barbecue, Mr. Tan used the grill plate gripper shown in the diagram below to remove this heavy charred grill plate and replace it with a new grill plate. It's the handle of this thing called a grill plate gripper and it's a charred grill plate. Now, if you're like me, you may be wondering, what is a grill plate gripper? What is a charred grill plate? Because this is the first time I have come across these words. Now, don't be confused by this because you don't need to be confused by something that you do not know. What you need to see here is, all right, what can I understand from this question? Barbecue is a place where there's a lot of heat involved, a lot of cooking involved. All right, so they are grilling something on the on, on this um, grill plate. Now, chart means it has turned black. You know, like when you barbecue something or you overcook something, it turns black. And after that, you must wash it, right? But it's going to be over the flame, it's going to be hot. So you're going to lift it up with something. And I guess this is a device that looks like a fork that's going to grip onto the grills. All these lines are known as grills. And then remove it. So this question is about the property of the material that should be used to make the handle of this. So property of the material for the handle. That's what the question here asks. Huh? Which material is the most suitable for making the handle? Now, of course, you don't want a handle that breaks easily, right? You want it to be strong. Strong means it doesn't break easily. So that will be, no, I don't want, will it break easily? No. Next is, if it's going to be a hot grill plate, I wouldn't want the heat to be conducted up this grill plate gripper into my hand when I'm holding at the handle. So I want the handle to be a poor conductor of heat. I do not want it to conduct heat easily. It's a no to this question. So therefore, the answer is D. 
The most suitable material is one that doesn't break easily, strong, and one that does not conduct heat easily. It's a poor conductor of heat. Next question. Now, Alia prepared the setup shown to collect clean water from the pond water. So there's boiling water. Always want to understand the picture. Don't just go to the words and try to guess the answer. So there's some water here and it's boiling. There's a flame below the heat source. And this is what mist that comes out. If you can see it, then it's mist. If you cannot see it, it will be the hot water vapor. Now there's a plate here. And the plate here is the cooler surface that allows the hot water vapor to touch it. To lose heat and change state. So water vapor will lose heat and change in their state from gas to liquid. So this cooler surface and the cooler the surface is, the higher the rate of condensation. If it is an icy cold, then of course the condensation, condensation will happen very quickly. If it is warm, then of course there's less condensation. That's the idea here. You want to find something that's really cool. The option could be either this, a cool iron plate or a cool plastic plate. Now for me, I will choose a cool iron plate. Why? Because iron is a good conductor of heat. Whatever heat it gains from the hot water vapor can be lost easily to conduct it into the surroundings. So it will remain, it will not stay hot. If it is the Plastic plate, plastic is a poor conductor of heat. If it gains heat, it does not conduct the heat away to the surrounding quickly nor easily. Alright, so one is the answer for question 17. Next one, question 18. So a compass has a small magnet that can rotate freely as shown in the diagram below. So this itself is a magnet and this is a north pole of the magnet in the compass, this will be the south pole. As just a quick recall for you, if you hang a bar magnet, alright, and on the retort stand, you just tie a string to it, and let it swing on its own for a while, it will come to a stop and you will point in a certain direction, and you call it the north-south direction. Now, four bar magnets are arranged such that they are attracted to each other. And attracted means that you know that unlike Poles attract. And unlike poles means north and south, south and north are unlike. They are different. That's why it's called unlike. Like poles will repel. So since these are all attracted to each other, then the poles must be all unlike poles. Now I already written down the poles here. Let's check it from right. So the compass is placed here. Remember we talked about this, it's a north pole and the white color part is a south pole. So if it's a south and it's pointing towards J, then J must be attracting the south. So it must be north attracting south. This north is south. This north is south, north, south, north, south. If it is south, then it must attract north. And the north part is a dark color part, so it should look like this. So I should look for the answer, the compass, if the needle pointing in this direction. And that answer is this. Let's go to question 19. Now, Josephine released the marble from the top of the ram and allowed it to roll over surface K before it, come, it came to a stop. So this is surface K. Now, she repeat the experiment on surfaces L, M, and N. So by changing the surfaces, that the marble is rolling on, she's changing the amount of frictional force that is generated when the marble moves across the different surfaces. The diagram below shows the distance traveled by the marble on each surface. So you can, as you can see, on surface L, it traveled to this part. On surface M, it traveled the furthest. On surface N, it travels the least. So it can travel very far, means that there must be very little friction. Remember this is the direction of motion. Frictional force opposes motion. Since it can travel very far, the frictional force must be very little. The least. And since this one couldn't travel very far, the frictional force between the marble and the surface must be the greatest. So if we want to choose a material L, M or N, 
to cover the uh, floor of a bathroom and bathroom is always quite wet and it could be slippery. So which material will you choose? Of course, you will choose the material that is a roughest surface. Now, I can't tell from the picture that it's rough, but as you know, a rough surface will help to generate the most frictional force when the, the surfaces are in contact. So I will choose N. Okay. Next one, question 20, electrical system question. Now, Sharon has four objects to be placed at points W, X, Y, and Z in the electrical circuit shown. So W, X, Y, Z. Two of the objects are electrical conductors and the other two are electrical insulators. So if Sharon only wants two of the bulbs to light up, which of the following shows where she should place the four objects? Now how should we do this in the actual test? I would suggest use a pencil and do what I'm, I've, I've been showing you in a while. And then you can erase it off and it doesn't meet your needs. What do I mean? Because you have only have these four options, right? If I were you, I'll use pencil right now, okay? So if I have W and X are conductors, so I'll put uh, C for conductors and then I for insulators. I'll show you the answer. The answer is 2. Now 2 says that the conductors are X and Z. So I put a C for conductor, X and Z is a conductor. Conductor of the electricity means that electricity can pass through it. And then they say that W and Y are insulators of electricity. So I put down here, insulator, insulator. And then I start to trace out the path of the electricity using arrows, just to guide me. Remember, do all this in pencil. So if you try an option and it's wrong, just erase it off. I'll start from the plus and the current must always flow back somehow to the minus. No matter how it flows, it must flow back to the minus. If this is an insulator, the current flows up to this junction, this junction, it can't flow through this part because this will create an open circuit. It's like a gap that the current cannot flow through. So it will avoid this and it just keep on moving down. A, first bulb that's lit up. I have one bulb lit up. Then at this junction, it must decide where should I go, current says. Well, I can go here because this one creates an open circuit again. I move up towards Z because Z is a conductor. So current flow up here, continue flowing. A second bulb that is lit. Move down and can move through the conductor X. Move up, 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 back to minus and just keep flowing this way. And that's how the current flows in this circuit when the, when the objects are arranged in this manner. Then I can count 1, 2. So 2 bulbs are lit. And that meets the condition of the question. And the answer is 2. Next one. Mutu connected a battery and a bulb using a circuit card shown below the bulb data. So what you see is the, is the front part. But what is behind are some wires that you do not see. So basically behind this card there are wires but you can't see this. Some of you might have done this for your practical test in your school or your experiments in the classroom when you're in P5. Alright, so of course this, if you look at this from the top, you can all you see is a gap. And of course if the gap is an open circuit, current cannot flow through. But since the bulb lit up, means that somehow A and C must have been connected at the, uh, behind the cut underneath it. So if, if you can flip it around and see, or you can look through, this is the only one with A and C connected. So imagine I'll redraw the lines here now. It's like that. There are wires here. So current basically flows this plus and minus. Current flow through metal tip to the filament, down to the paper clip, to the wire, to B, then to C, then flow back to the minus and keep flowing like that. Okay? Answer is 1. For all the rest, you can see, right, our A and C are not connected by any wires at all. See, here, not con no connection, no connection to C, A is not connected to all this. Question 22, Cindy placed three objects L, M and N, one at a time in the beaker of water as shown below. So this is the one with no water, 
then simply place object L inside and notice the water level rose up. Why? Because matter occupies space. If L occupies space here, it's going to push the water that was occupying space here just now. For example, if the water were here just now, now the water is moved up. Okay. Then you replace, uh, take out the object L, replace the object M. M has a much larger volume, so it occupies even more space. So when it comes in here, the water that is displaced will be all the part is on top. So all the water here will actually on top here, we're actually occupying the space here earlier on. Alright, same thing, now I put an object in, the object is even much larger. Then it, imagine putting this inside this container. And because it occupies more space, Alright, so that the water that was occupying the space here just now get pushed to the side and upwards. Basically, the idea is testing the concept that matter occupies space. And the idea that no two matter can occupy the same space at the same time. So based on this observation, what can she say? Now, all the things about mass and weight cannot be correct. Just to tell mass or tell weight, uh, you need to use a weighing scale or a beam balance. Then you can tell which is heavier. Beam balance is something like that. So you hang an object here, an object here. Then you see if it's level, then of course they are of the same mass. If it tilts to one side, you know, for example, if it tilts to one side, then you know, this object is has more mass than this. Or use a weighing scale. So, Option A and B are definitely all out. If A is out, that tells you answer is only number 2. Now, let's check number 2. Huh? L, M and N sink in water. Obviously, right? they are all resting on the bottom of the beaker. L has the smallest volume. All right? That's why it displaces or push away the least amount of water. So that's why the water level here is the lowest compared to these two. Yeah, that's it. Now, next one. Now, can you push a wooden stick into the ground as shown in the diagram below? Like this. Now, you might have done this experiment before, which is the, uh, your teachers might have given you a piece of blue tag and then ask you to stick the pencil you know, on it. Then you shine torch light from different angles and ask you to observe the shadows that are formed. So, now the torch light is slanting to one side like this. You get a really long shadow. As you move the torch light right, uh, higher and higher up until it's directly over the pencil, then the shadow becomes very small. For example, as you can see here, right? I would like source just up here. Okay, so if I were to move this object, let me see how can I do this. You can see mm, not too clear. Let me try another light source. Okay, this is clearer. So there's a light source on this side right now, all right. Or rather, for your case, you will see it like this side. So, light side is shining down on the object. Now, if the object now moves nearer to it, the shadow actually becomes shorter. Mm, yeah, not too good. You can't see so clearly. Never mind. You can try out on your own. Okay, using your handphone torch light, using a pencil, and you can do it. Basically, as the torch light moves nearer and nearer to the position above the pencil, the shadow becomes shorter and shorter. Now, this is something like the position of the sun in the morning at 8 a.m. And the position of the sun will change during the day. And noontime is just directly above us. Then the position of the sun will keep shifting towards the other direction until at 4 p.m. is near, nearing to one side. Eventually, in the evening, the sun will set. So, she measure the length of the shadow of the wooden stick every two hours from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. That's why we're now 8 a.m., 4 p.m. So which of the folding graphs best describe the length of the shadow formed by the wooden stick at different times of the day? Remember, when it's at the sides, not at an angle like this, they form the longer shadows. As they move towards the center, it should be shorter. So we expect to see a graph like that. Shorter, 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 longer, 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 longer. And this part will be the 12 p.m. This part will be the 8 a.m. This part will be the 4 p.m. I expect to see a graph like that. Okay, that's why 4 is the answer.
Can you then just one more question?